Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining our webinar today. Um, we're so excited to have you here with us and we have a lot of really great content to share with you about the Aviva contest and of course how to increase your chances of being selected as one of the winning charities. My name is Sandra and I'm a Digital Marketing Associate at Canada Helps. So for those of you who are new to Canada Helps, Canada Helps is a charity helping charities. We provide charities with open access to our affordable online fundraising platform and training so that they can better connect with the people who support them. For donors, we offer a one-stop shop for donating and fundraising for any Can registered Canadian charity online. Since 2000, over 1 million Canadians have donated through Canada Helps and together we've raised over 700 million in donations. All right, are we ready to get started? So today I have the pleasure of welcoming Julia from Aviva to present this webinar. Once Julia is finished with her presentation, we'll move on to our question and answer period where you may ask Julia any questions that you may have. All right, ready Julia? Here we go, I'm just gonna pass it over. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for having me here today. I just want to quickly introduce myself. Um, my name is Julia O'Day and I work for Aviva Canada and I manage the Aviva Community Fund, also known as the ACF campaign. I'm very excited to walk through how to participate in this year's ACF. Um, there's my contact details right on the screen. So if you have any questions or questions that come to mind in the next day or so, you can email me directly. So during the next hour, I'm going to walk through what exactly the Aviva Community Fund is, how it works, I'm going to provide advice on how to enter a winning idea, and also showcase some past winners from the ACF. But before we get started into this slide, I think it's a great time to ask a poll question, which is, have you heard of the Aviva Community Fund? So just go ahead and let us know. Oh, look. So it looks like so far um, more of you know about the Aviva Community Fund than don't. It's evening out a little bit. So that's great because we're definitely going to walk through and everyone by the end of the webinar is going to know lots about the ACF campaign. Oh wow, it's really evening, in, evening out. Lots of you do. Okay, so to start off, I'm not sure if everyone knows that Aviva is actually one of the leading property and casualty insurance groups in the country. And the way that Aviva invests in positive change is through the ACF campaign, Canada's longest running online funding competition. Each year, Aviva invests a million dollars to support causes that Canadians care about most. So since the inception in 2009, the ACF has provided 7.5 million in funding to over 250 different initiatives. Okay, so how does the Aviva Community Fund work? The ACF supports funding ideas that come in all shapes and sizes, whether it's from a large national charity or a smaller group, whether it's for funding to speed up a project that you already have started or you want to start a new project. We encourage all charities to submit an idea for funding. The campaign has three main phases, submit, promote, and vote. I'm going to walk you through each, give you a high level overview of each of the phases. So the submit phase is really the launch of the campaign where you can officially submit an application for funding. This is when the ACF website offers the online submission form. Once you submit your idea, it's reviewed for eligibility, which we're going to get into later in the webinar. The promote phase is about telling everyone that you know that you've submitted an idea to the ACF. Once your submission is approved, you're provided with a URL to your idea page on our website. This is for you to share with your network and start promoting your idea before the voting phase starts. The voting phase is when anyone registered on the website can cast 18 votes for the idea that they are supporting. A great thing to know is that you can cast all 18 votes at once. The 18 votes can be put towards one idea or you can spread them around for many different ideas. So I'm just going to give you a quick snapshot of the 2017 campaign dates. So our website actually updated on June 29th with all necessary information on this year's campaign. Submissions open starting September 13th 
at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and close on October 2nd at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This gives you 20 days to complete and submit your application. But I really encourage everyone not to actually wait until the very last day to submit. Submitting early gives you more time to promote your idea before the voting round. Voting launches on October 10th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and closes on October 19th at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Everyone has 10 days to cast their 18 votes. The announcement of the finalists and winners will happen at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on November 1st and December 5th. So make sure that you visit the website to find out who the finalists and the winners are. Again, submissions open on September 13th and close on October 2nd. One thing that we did was that we decided to ask some of our winners to provide some advice on why they submitted to the Viva Community Fund. I know that deciding to submit an idea can seem a little overwhelming at first, but it's a really smooth process. That's why I wanted to share some advice from last year's winners. One group was already in the middle of a project and decided to give it a shot and really felt that they wanted to share their heart and passion for the work that they were doing in the community, which is a great way to tell the community about what you're doing. Another group was encouraged to submit by an Aviva insurance broker, which we're also going to talk about later in the campaign. They had a strong existing community support and they, had, they were very confident and thought they could do really, really well. Okay, so I think it's actually time to ask another poll question, which is, we want to know if anyone has submitted an idea to the Viva Community Fund. Oh wow, so it looks like a lot of you have actually not submitted an idea to the Viva Community Fund, which is great because I think that after this webinar, you're definitely going to want to submit an idea for funding, um, and you're going to be able to get all the information that you need um, in the next hour. Okay, so I think we're ready to move on. Um, so one thing to start with is that submitting is very easy as the application is all online on our website. One thing to note is that you, once you submit your ideas, you're unable to make any changes. This is why it is so important to download the questions now available on our website so you can prepare. And I just wanna call that out again that on the Viva Community Fund website right now, you're able to download the full submission questions, which will give you a, an amazing head start before September, the September launch. Another point that I want to dive deeper into is the review process once you do submit. So once you submit, we have a great team that reviews the ideas for eligibility. There are three main actions that happens once you press that submit button. The first is that your idea is approved, which is great news. You'll receive a confirmation email with an idea number and a link to view your idea page on the ACF website. The second is that we need a little bit more information on your idea before we can go ahead and approve it. So this is definitely not a bad sign. We might need, you, we might need to change the idea category that you're in or we have some general questions regarding your budget. You'll receive an email asking you to provide more information in regards to your application. Then you'll be able to access your submission form again and go ahead and make those changes. Once we receive all the additional information that we need, we can move forward and approve your idea. The third is that your idea does not exactly align with the eligibility for ACF funding and unfortunately we cannot approve it. However, during this webinar we're going to walk through exactly what our eligibility terms are so we can make sure that every idea that you submit gets approved. Okay, so one of the most important things that I want to call out is registering on the ACF website. So if you're not registered, you are unable to submit or vote. You also won't receive important campaign information throughout the campaign. Um, and as well, we won't be able to give you information on whether your idea is approved or not. So I encourage everyone after the webinar to go ahead and register on our website. So now we're going to move into the eligibility section. Um, it's really important that before you do submit that you do know whether the idea that you're thinking of or the project, whether you know if it's 
eligible for funding or not. So I'm going to start by walking through some of the main points in eligibility. In order to submit an idea for funding, it must be associated with a CR registered charity, which I know all of you are, public foundations, nonprofit organizations, social enterprises, registered B Corps, publicly funded schools, university colleges, and municipalities or government entities. The idea or project itself must take place in Canada and be accessible to individuals of all faiths and religious backgrounds. So for example, if you are a church and you're su submitting an idea, the program itself must be accessible to all faiths. A great example of this is last year's winner, the First United Church out of Vancouver, who won for expanding their shelter services. The shelter services itself is open to everyone of all faiths. New to this year is that we will fund a project or idea that will be implemented over a two-year period, whereas compared to last year, it was only allowed for a one-year period. So the idea that you're submitting for funding has to be implemented by December 2019. Again, these are just some high-level points, and we have our full eligibility guideline on the website. So now we're going to spend some time talking about ideas that the Viva Community Fund does not fund. Um, ideas that were, are requesting for funding for a capital campaign where 60% has not been secured. So I know and we all know that running a capital campaign is very common in the charitable sector. So one thing that we wanted to call out is that we are more inclined to fund ideas that are running capital campaigns in the mature stages. So for example, if you're trying to raise a million dollars, you must have secured 600,000 at the time of submitting to the Viva Community Fund. So we're not saying that we don't support capital campaigns, we're just putting some limitations on that. We also don't fund ideas that are associated with operational or overhead costs. However, we, ha we will fund salaries where it is 25% or less of the total request for funding. So let's say you're requesting from us $50,000 for a program, and in that you have allocation towards somebody's salary. That's fine, but the total amount dedicated to salaries would have to be less than 12500 So we will also not fund ideas that are focused on for-profit outcome or benefit of an individual. We also don't fund any ideas that are associated with animal welfare, and this we will talk, talk to more, because I know that there are a lot of amazing groups doing work in the animal sector. So we have a strong um, three funding pillar, which we're going to talk about later, that align with our business strategy. But however, if you are an animal-focused charity that needs funding for a program that aligns with the three funding categories, you are eligible to apply. Again, these are just some of the high-level points, and we have a full detailed document that will really help you figure out what idea is eligible or not, because we know that within charities, there are many different areas that you're probably in need of funding for. Okay, we're going to start now by talking about our funding levels. So once you've reviewed the eligibility and you have a sense of what you need funding for, it's time to start thinking about what funding category you would fall into. So this year we're actually offering three funding levels. The first is the small funding level. That means that you're requesting funds for up to 50000 The large funding level focuses on ideas that are asking for funding between fifty and 100000 We also have a new idea category this year called Community Legacy. That is a one-time prize of 150000 which I'll provide more information on during the webinar. It's also important that once you've decided which funding level you fall into, that you're able to outline exactly where you'll, you will be allocating the funds in relation to your idea. This is very important. Now we're going to start talking about our idea categories, which, is our, which are, are also our funding streams. So there are four idea categories this year. I'm going to first talk briefly to our new community legacy category, which is very exciting. So in honor of Canada's 150th year, we introduced a new category that is only open to current or social, current or aspiring social entrepreneurs aged 18 to 25 to submit an idea in the environmental sector. So if you know any youth that are doing great work, I definitely encourage you to encourage them to submit an idea. There will be five finalists in this idea category with one winner of 150,000. 
So our three remaining idea categories are community development, health, and resilience. I'm going to provide a little bit more information on what those funding categories are than what's on the screen. So community development focuses on ideas that help, that help educate, reduce poverty, infuse culture, and support important research for the betterment of the community. This could include projects that serve marginalized populations, Low income, newcomer, homeless are those in need of transitional housing. This category also includes projects that fight poverty, such as assistance programs, drop-in centers, food banks, or awareness programs, as well all projects that promote culture, such as music programs, drama, or the arts. So community health focuses on ideas that support the well-being of communities that make it easier for adults and children alike to lead a healthy, active lifestyle. This includes community programs that provide support to those impacted by major health or related issues, support purchasing new equipment for hospitals. This also includes ideas that support experiences for youth, such as programs that help fund sports or summer camps for those that would otherwise not be able to afford it. And last, our community, like, our community resilience category focuses on ideas that help create a more sustainable future and mitigate the risk of climate change. This also includes protecting wildlife habitat. So again, we have detailed criteria, even more than what I just spoke about, on our website that you can easily download. Also, when you submit an application, we will review to ensure that you have chosen the correct idea category. And if, and if we feel that you should be in another category, we'll reach out um, before we make that change. Okay, so once you've decided your funding level and your idea category, you're ready to start the full submission process. Um, as I mentioned before, right now you can visit the website and download the full submission question, so you're definitely prepared for September. There are four sections to the application, and this is just a quick snapshot of what would fall into each, um, into each step. So the first step focuses on who you are. This is where you provide information on who is submitting the idea for funding. You'll be asked to choose who a primary contact is. This primary contact person will be the one to receive all information related to your idea. This is also where you will be asked to choose your idea category that we just spoke about. The second focuses on the organization, so your charity. You'll be asked if you've entered the ACF before, but from the poll that we just did, it doesn't seem like a lot of you have, or if you have any additional partners. The Viva Community Fund has no restrictions on submitting an idea for funding more um, year to year, so don't worry about if you are one of the ones that have submitted an idea, even if you have gone on to win. The fourth section will ask you about your key performance indicators. So what will success look like? How will you know that you're achieving what you set out to do? Don't forget that you also have the ability to upload photos and videos so you can get really creative with your submission. And again, this is just a high level overview of the questions. So as I've been mentioning throughout the webinar, there are tons of campaign documents that will just help you succeed in the ACF on our website right now. We have the idea submission guide that includes what includes our eligibility guidelines, our idea categories, the submission questions, and examples of past winners. Um, as well, we have separate documents. If you're looking for something specific and don't want the full document, you can download just our funding guidelines or our fact sheet on each idea category. I also encourage everyone to download the terms and conditions. It's a great tool to really understand um, how the competition works. And again, these are live on the website right now. So our past winners um, provided some advice on the application process that I'm excited to share with you. Dartmouth North Community Food Center said that being clear, concise, and compelling will ensure you are letting people know exactly which kind of change that you want to make. They also included important facts, figures, and stories about the current impact they are having on the community in their submission. One of the groups that I talked to as well said that they pulled a lot of information from their annual reports, which was very helpful. So that's a great, um, that's a great set of advice that you can all take and work with when you submit an idea. Two 2016 winners said that it was really important to articulate the specific community need or issue and highlight how receiving the funds from the Viva Community Fund would make a strong difference. As well, knowing your purpose and of course starting early will create a great application. Now we're going to jump into how to promote your idea before the voting round. 
So again, the promoting phase is about telling everyone you know that you have submitted an idea to the campaign. Once your idea is approved, you will receive a URL to share with your network. That URL is one of the most important things that you'll receive. The website will not show any projects until the first day of voting. The only way somebody can see your idea is if you've provided them with the URL. This is to ensure that no idea has more time on the website than another. A great tip is tapping into your current network. If you have a large donor base, send out an email to them and encourage them to vote for you. If you don't, but you have a large participant or program base, then encourage them to vote for you. You can even set up a computer in your reception area and, and ask everyone that comes in to vote for your idea. And also a great tip is to scan your community for potential sponsors. Get local employees, schools to support your idea. Some helpful tips is using social media to get your message out and to tell everyone that you have an idea in the ACF. Great to know is that there is a whole page on the ACF dedicated to helping you promote your idea on social media or on your website. There are social media graphics that you can download and share on Facebook or on Twitter. There are also posters, two different sizes, that you can print out and write your idea name on there and you can post those all around your community. You can give them to your to local employees to post in their offices as well. We also asked our winners to provide some advice on how they received so many votes. Cape Breton Regional Hospital Foundation printed small info sheets and distributed them. They also asked for support from radio station and Aviva Brokers. They posted information in community locations. And this is really smart what they did, which was they tagged various businesses on Facebook, asking them for their employees to vote for them. I think that's a great, um, a great tip to take forward. Another example is from Dartmouth North Community Food Center again and said they brainstormed ways to engage their broader community. They reached out to pr people who use their programs as well as partners. And again, this group is saying social media is a huge key to success. So if you don't have social media, this is a perfect time to set up an account. Now we're going to jump into what to know before, what to know about the voting round. So anyone registered on the ACF site will be given 18 votes to use during the voting round. They can either use all 18 votes for one idea or spread them around. Great news is that they can cast all their 18 votes at once, so you are really only asking your supporters to spend less than 10 minutes to support you. The top 15 ideas that receive the most votes in their funding level and idea category will go on to become finalists. The top five ideas that receive the most votes in Community Legacy will also go on to become finalists. The 35 finalists will be announced on November 1st. Then they go on to be evaluated by our panel of independent judges who will select the winners. So what is a broker-supported idea? Again, I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar that the Aviva Community Fund is run by Aviva Canada, which is an insurance company. So and Aviva Canada uses has Aviva Brokers. So Aviva Brokers have been supporting the ACF since 2009. Um, a vote from a broker can ensure that you become a finalist. In the background, we identify a broker vote separate from the general public. On every single idea page, there will be a section that shows you the closest Aviva brokers to your idea location and their contact number. That's for you to reach out to them directly and ask for their support. All of our Aviva brokers have been provided information on the ACF campaign and are always eager to support initiatives. So when a broker votes for an idea, it automatically becomes broker supported. Then the idea with the most broker votes will automatically become a finalist and will be named the top rank broker supported idea. So now I wanted to provide some examples of the 2016 winners. This is to give everyone a chance to see the, div the diversity in, in the winning ideas that it's not just larger organizations. First, we're going to start with Caleb's Courage Fund for Pediatric Palliative Care. This was submitted by Cape Breton Regional Hospital under the Community Health Pillar. They received $100,000 to support transforming their palliative care pediatric room. They had a very strong social media presence that included strong videos and testimonials. 
The next is Share the Harvest, Feed the People, which was submitted by Harvest House Atlantic to renovate their emergency shelter to meet the growing needs of their community. This demonstrates that not it's not only large organizations in large communities, but small but smaller charities and smaller communities that have a great shot at winning. And last is Food Forest, which was submitted by the Mental Health Association, Gray Bruce. They submitted an idea to the Community Resilience category to expand their community garden, and they received $100,000 for their idea. I'm not going to go into detail in these, but I wanted to provide a snapshot of winners from 2015 and 2013. I encourage everyone to read through the descriptions, as it really, again, showcases the variety in ideas and funding. So over the past nine years, um, the Viva Community Fund launched in 2009, there, there have been ideas that have come through that did not go on to win, but then came back the next year and went on to become finalists and then winners. I know submitting an idea to the campaign can really help shine a light on all the work that you're doing in your community. So when we asked what changed the most for our winners, they said that they have more exposure and credibility, that it was a very good community builder whether they won or not. They also have seen an increase in donations and general awareness. I really believe that you have no idea what can happen, and I encourage everyone to just really submit an idea for funding starting September 13th on the Viva Community Fund website. And one last thing is make sure to follow us on social media. So we have a strong social media presence, and you'll also be able to get some great hints and tips on there as well for the Viva Community Fund. Visit our website, which the link is there, and you have two email addresses. You have my personal email and the Viva Community Fund email. So if you have any questions um, after the webinar, questions about your submission, feel free to reach out to either of those emails. Okay, thank you so much. And again, submissions open September 13th, and it definitely does all start with your great idea. So now we're going to move into the question and answer period. So if anybody has any questions for me regarding the Viva Community Fund, um, this is your time to start asking them. Okay, so we're starting to see some questions coming in. We're just going to give a couple more minutes for everyone to get those questions in, and then we're going to get started, and I'm going to provide provide some answers to all these great questions. All right, um, this is Cindy from Canada Helps. Uh, we're going to take on the questions right now. There are so many amazing questions here, so um, we're going to get started. Um, I'll be passing the headset back and forth to Julia over here, so just bear with us. Um, our first question is from Erica. Um, Erica wrote, I remember that in the past, votes were available per day. Does that mean there are simply 18 for the whole voting time and up to you on um, how to spend them? So that is a great question to ask because um, there was a change in the competition where previously everybody did have 18 votes and they were only allowed to use one vote per day. And that changed last year. So um, anybody that registers on the site has 18 votes in total during the voting round and they can cast them all for one idea or they can spread them around for many different ideas. So just to again to re reiterate that is that any everybody has 18 votes they can cast them all in one day which is great because then you're only asking your supporters to spend less than 10 minutes to support your idea thanks for that Julia okay we have a great question from Lance um, if an idea receives the first sorry the one-time legacy community prize can they in future years submit for smaller ideas or will they be unable to enter in future years? So that's another great question because we do not have restrictions on reapplying for the Viva Community Fund. So the Community Legacy Fund um, is a one-time um, category that we're offering this year that's only open to youth aged 18 to 25. Um, but overall in the campaign, there's no restriction. So if you've submitted an idea, if you've become a finalist or have become a winner, you are still able to come back the next year and submit again. Thanks, Julia. Okay, um, great question from Sandra here. A question about the no more than 25% for salaries um, or admin. Does this include people that will be hired just for the project 
um, for example, not on the st not on staff but contract. Now, for example, one of our projects is a series of mask making workshops which explores mental wellness. 90% of the costs is the facilitators, so art therapists, artists, etc. Where only about 10% of the costs would go to art supplies. Um, would this be ineligible? So that's another great question. So this also depends on the type of funding that you're requesting. So the reason that we've put in some guidelines on the amount that we would fund for a salary is because we are aware that in order to execute a project, you do need to allocate funds towards a salary. So one thing that I can say is that it must be less than 25% of the total amount of funding that you're asking for. Um, and you can definitely visit the website and download that eligibility guideline, which will give you more, more options. But if you have determined your total funding required, um, you can also email me and I'll be able to let you know um, if, if you've hit that 25% mark. But that's definitely a great question. Thank you. Okay, I see a number of questions about the number of ideas uh, that can be submitted, so we'll take Kalani's. Um, can a charity submit more than one idea, whether or not they are in different categories? So that's a great question. So we do only allow um, a charity to submit one idea. However, um, one of the things that this does bring up is um, different charities um, that are under the same name but incorporated separately. So we do allow groups like the Mental Health Association um, in Gray Bruce, there was also another mental health association that was submitting idea because they were separate and had a separate um, governing board, they were, were allowed. However, um, a charity is only allowed to submit one idea. Okay, I see another uh, number of votes coming up here about the um, so you may or may not be able to answer this question, and if you don't know off the top of your head, we can um, we can maybe include in the follow up email. But Julia, do you have any idea, um, or can you share a ballpark for how many votes a typical finalist um, receives? So that's a great question, and just to put into um, some background, last year the Viva Community Fund received 3.2 million votes during the voting period. Um, and you know what, it's a huge range of, for the winners as well as the finalists. We had some that were in the 40,000 to 100,000 um, and it really depended on the organization itself. Again, something that is really interesting to know is that the smaller communities um, that are a little bit more um, uh, working together had higher votes come in. But um, again, we had 3.2 million votes come in last year and um, the votes for the winners and the finalists range from anywhere from 40,000 up to 100,000. Okay, great. So I see a few questions coming in about voting. So um, one person was asking, do people have to register to vote? And Henry is asking, can you explain the voting process again? So if you could maybe just go over the key points uh, one more time. Yes, for sure. So, <clears throat> once you submit an idea to the Viva Community Fund, you will then have a page on the on the ACF website, and that is so people can visit that page and vote for your idea. So what happens is that once your idea is approved and voting goes live on October 10th, Anyone that you want to vote for your idea will have to visit the website. First, they have to register. Then they will go on and find your idea, and they will cast their 18 votes for you. And what that what that means is that the ideas with the highest votes at the end of the voting round will go on to the finalist round. So that's why it's really important to share that URL um, and to make sure that you're telling everyone that you have an idea. So again, everybody has 18 votes, and you must be registered on the website to vote vote for an idea. Okay, so the next question from Alexandra is a great um, is a great question leading from the question you just answered. So her question is, how do the judges decide from the finalists? Um, what kind of things do they consider? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what happens is that they look at all the finalists and they are evaluated them based on specific criteria that we provide them, such as <clears throat> Will this idea create, um, is this a, a sustainable idea? What's the longevity of idea? How many people will they impact um, with this specific idea? And it's um, a weighted scale and that 
therefore it's automatically identified who will become the winners. Okay, so let's take another, um, another question. We still have uh, quite a bit to cover. Um, so we have one question from Jenny. Um, do you ever fund components of cultural community festivals or do you focus more on permanent programs? That's a great question, and we do focus on um, funding more long-term programs, um, and that's based on what we've seen come through to the Viva Community Fund, and that's also why we um, increase the years of funding this year to fund ideas over a two-year period. Okay, so Roy wants to know, um, how do we find out if our organization has submitted in the past? And that's a great question. I mean, if there's a way to find out, maybe they can, you know, refer and see what kind of ideas they su they've submitted in the past. Yeah, so that's definitely something that we can look into. Um, on the last slide in the presentation is the contact information. So if you want to send an email to the Viva Community Fund mailbox and just let them know what your organization is, and we can do a search to see if we can find any past um, ideas that have been submitted. But again, um, if, we, if we can't locate that, if that was too far back, I would encourage you to submit again because there are no restrictions on that. Okay, our next question is from Sarah. Is there only one winner per category? So what happens is that the final, there's 35 finalists and five, um, five finalists from each idea category and funding level. So if we look at the community health category, there'll be five finalists in the large funding level of community health and in the small level of community health, what happens is that once the finalists move on to the judging round, it's based on the judges scoring that will let us know how many winners in each category there will be. So if you look back on the website and you look at the past winners, it varies every year on who, um, how many winners come from each category, but we bring an equal amount forward to the judges. Um, great, thank you, Julia. Um, I have a great question from Mark here, and I, I get the feeling that he's in the same shoes as um, a lot of the charities listening in, um, especially because a lot of the charities here are small to medium-sized organizations. So Mark wants to know, um, what advice would you give to a smaller organization that does not have a large social media following or many participants, but would submit a project that would have tremendous impact? Well, the first thing I would say is definitely to submit an idea, and I definitely want to call out one of the groups that I spoke about, which was um, Harvest House Atlantic, which is from a very small organization who went on to win and and won over larger groups from larger communities. But one of the things is that you you really need to take the time to understand who you're connected with in the community. So we had a group that connected with all the car dealerships. Who's the largest employer in your community? Where does most of your community resonate? Where do they go every day? Um, do you have a connection with that group? Do you know somebody that does? Um, and can they promote your idea? Can you give them, uh, can you print cards that say, here's our idea URL, please vote for us starting October 10th and have somebody hand that out? Can you put an ad in your local paper? Um, these are all ways to really get the word out that you're competing in the Aviva Community Fund. Thanks, Julia. Um, I see a couple comments coming in here. I think there might be a typo um, in the, maybe the website on one of the slides. So we will correct that and um, just, you know, in, in the slides that are sent to you via email, you'll have, you'll have the right uh, copy. Um, sorry about that. Um, and our next question is from Anne. Um, Julia, do you have any idea how many um, projects are typically submitted um, to the project? Sorry, the contest? <laughs> Last year we had um, 400, over 450 ideas that were on the website um, and we have larger ideas in the community development compared to community health and resilience. Thank you. I have an awesome question from Amy. Um, can organizations incentivize voting? So um, Amy wants to know if they partner with a sponsor can anyone who votes receive some kind of a coupon or voucher? That's a great question. Um, 
so if that is taken offline and dealt with you, then we have no um, restrictions on incentivizing for votes. Um, we've seen people do pancake breakfasts. We've seen people do Tim Hortons gift cards. Um, but we, we don't have any restrictions on that. One of the things that I definitely want to call out is that um, we do have restrictions on that. It, only one individual can cast 18 votes. And sometimes what we see happening with contests is that some people do create um, different email addresses. Or if you have a work email and you have a personal email and you create a profile and you cast your 18 votes, um, that's actually not, not allowed. And what we do is we do review those votes behind the scenes. So we're able to um, kind of keep an eye on that. And so last year when we did have a group that ran a contest, they emailed us um, at the Viva Community Fund and just let us know what it is. And so we could um, just make sure that it aligns with the terms and conditions. Okay, I have a great question from uh, Sadun. Hello, I just wanted to know who are the judges? Are they specific chosen people or are they related to Aviva? Also, a side question, why are there specifically 18 votes? That's an, definitely an interesting question. So I'll pass that on to Julia. That's a great question. So the judging panel um, <clears throat> is selected based on a skills uh, skills matrix that highlights all of the all of the skills that we would want someone to have in order to provide um, the scoring for for charitable projects. So they are from the charity sector, and right now we are um, just recruiting for this year's panel. And when that is finalized, we announce them on the website and we put up all of the bios. Um, so there, every year there is one Aviva employee judge, but um, the other set, the other six judges are all external, um, and they come with great credentials and they're all from um, the charity sector and really understand the work that they're that you guys are doing in the community and the 18 votes actually comes from when the competition started and you could only vote once per day the voting round was 18 days so you had 18 votes and so what's happened over time is we've kept it at 18 votes but you can cast all those votes um, at once and we only have a 10-day voting period this year Great, thank you, Julia. Um, okay, I have Sarah's question here. Um, this question is for all of our amazing animal charities who we love very much. Um, can you say some more about what would and what would not be eligible um, ideas from an animal, sorry, from an animal welfare organization? That's a great question. So I think the first step is we review the three uh, funding categories that we have, community health, community resilience, and community development. So all of the ideas that are submitted have to meet a criteria within those three categories. So if you are an animal organization, you cannot submit an idea for something that's not listed under those three or that falls without that. But if you are an animal organization and you want to um, have a community garden or you want to put solar panels on your building, then you can submit an idea under the community resilience idea category. So I really encourage you to take a look at those three um, funding, uh, the idea categories in detail, and then you'll be able to see what, I, what ideas you can submit funding for. It's not that we restrict um, animal welfare charities, it's that we restrict projects um, based on the outcome. So that's why if you are still doing a project that meets the outcomes, um, then you would be eligible. Our next question is from Sylvie. Can submissions and support votes be done in French? Yes, we have um, a French site as well. So once you visit the Viva Community Fund site, you just toggle over to French and everything will be there. And you'll, be, you'll have the submission form in French and we have um, communications in French as well. So that will be supported. And we've had lots of um, winners that come through the Montreal and Quebec area as well. Okay, our next question is from from Jackie, how many projects will be awarded per category and how many projects for the community legacy project? Additionally, can you submit an idea for a project that has already started? 
So that's a great question. Yes, if you have a project that's already ongoing and you need you require more funding, you can submit an application. Um, again, there's 35 finalists that will be announced. There's five finalists, sorry, there's 15 finalists in each idea category in each funding level. So if you look at the community health idea category, at the end of the voting round, there will be five finalists under community health in the, lar in the large funding level and in the small funding level. So in total for those three, that brings us to 30 finalists. For the community legacy idea category, there will be five finalists and one grand prize winner. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Julia. We still have a lot more questions um, that we are working through. Lots of really great questions here. Um, so, Julia, our next question is from Ali. Um, how important is it to have partners for your project, and how involved do they have to be? So having partners for your project is really something that's up to you. Um, sometimes we see that if there are different, or if you are already working with another organization in your community that has the same mission as you, um, you can link together to create a new project and submit that for funding. Um, <clears throat> as well, during the submission, form, we ask you if you do have other funding partners because we just would like to understand who else is supporting the idea. But we don't see it as something that either launches you as a, a winner or doesn't. So it's really your preference to whether you would want um, a partner for your submission. And again, just something to mention on the last question is that the finalists that do not go on to win become a winner will receive $5,000 um, to donate to a charity of their choice which can be them. Great. And then there's a follow-up question on that one you just answered. Do the partners need to fit the organization criteria as well? No, they don't. Um, if it, the submission is based upon the organization that is submitting, that is the charity, um, it's also who will be receiving the funds. So. <clears throat> if they have a different mission, um, that's fine. But if they're supporting you in a different way to get your project off the ground, then that's just something that you would have to outline in your submission. Um, I have another question from Mona about, I guess, the language. So um, probably for our bilingual charities, um, if they submit, if they submit the same project on the English and French site, will the votes be counted for the same project? So it is one website. Um, so if you have submitted an idea, but your language preference is French, um, then you will, you will have everything in French. However, it is one idea. So if somebody registers and votes for your idea um, and casts their 18 votes, it, it's on the English site, that transfers over to the French site as well. Um, okay, I have a few questions coming in about the location. So Lucy's wondering, are ideas from a Canadian registered um, charity for work overseas eligible? Have any ever made finalists or won a grant? That's a great question. So one of the eligibility um, items that we have is that we do only fund ideas that take place in Canada, where the impact would be within Canada. So I know there's a lot of great organizations um, and charities that train people and send them overseas. Um, unfortunately, we, we only fund ideas that take place within Canada and benefit Canada. Okay. Our next question is from Jackie. I'm not quite sure that we answered this question already, but she, Jackie is saying, just doing some reading, looks like there is only one grand prize uh, winner for each category. Is that correct? That's a great question. I think that's um, which keeps coming up is that, um, again, there are 35 finalists that move forward to the judging round. Last year, we had 13 
grand prize winners. So every year it differs ba based on um, the scores that the judges give, but there are 35 finalists that go forward to the judges. We give away a million dollars every year. So we allocate um, that million dollars, and once that's done um, and we have nothing left to give, we take those winners. So last year that was 13, 13 grand prize winners, and it's also based on how much funding um, the finalists have requested. Um, okay, great. Catherine um, has a great question here. You mentioned the project will need to be completed by 2019. What if we're not sure if the project will be completed by then? Can we still apply the idea? So something that I mentioned earlier was that we are increasing, um, we increased the term of support this year from one year to two years. Um, and so your project would have to be completed by December 2019. Um, but I definitely still encourage everyone to submit an idea because we do go through the review process. So if you submit and, and you're writing, you know, maybe one part isn't going to be completed by then, but all of the, the funding that we've asked for will be um, allocated before then, that's something we can look at. So uh, we do have a strong review process and people that will reach out if we need some clarity. So th what we've outlined is that we only fund over a two-year period, but I encourage you to submit um, and we can take a look at your application and, and try to make it work. All right, so I have a few questions in co uh, coming in about past winners, Julia. So maybe you can share with the crowd um, where they can learn more about the past winners. Um, I know you've included some in the slides that we're sharing. I'll jump into a specific question from Joanna as well. Have there ever been recipients in the arts? Can we learn more about past approved art projects on your website? That's a great question. So right now on the Viva Community Fund website, on the top header, there is a section called Past Winners. And this is for you to review all of the past winners that we've had from, um, right now we have that that there from last year. Off the top of my head, I can't um, name off any of the, the arts, but definitely if you want to send me an email, um, I can follow up with you, but we have a whole page dedicated to past winners to help you understand um, who some of those organizations are. Okay, our next question is from Sherry. Hi, Julia. Sherry from Emma's Acres here. Can you speak about, uh, what is that? Is that bot votes? I think that says bot votes, but I'm um, sorry, Sherry, if there is if there's a typo or anything, I'm going to pass it on to Julia now. Just feel free to chat us in. So everyone, we have Sherry from Emma's Acres, and Emma's Acres was a 2015 grand prize winner. Um, and she's asking a question about, um, I think she's trying to say something about the vote. So as I mentioned before, um, we monitor all the votes that are cast during the voting period. So when you review those terms and conditions, we have some guidelines in there that say that creating multiple email accounts are actually not allowed. So again, for me, I have a work email, I have a personal email, I actually have a couple of personal emails. If I'm registered on the Viva Community Fund website and I use my work email and I cast my 18 votes, I am not allowed to register with any other email and cast votes because I've already done that. And what we do in the background is we review um, all of the votes that are cast and the IP addresses just to make sure that um, there's nothing going on that shouldn't be happening and that everybody is on an equal playing field. Um, and so that's what Emma, uh, Emma, that's what Sherry is talking to um, about the voting question. Thank you so much for that question. That's great. I get it now. That That is a really good question. Um, okay, um, I have another few questions coming in about the max amount of funding. So um, we'll take Kilani's here. If the project needs funding that is over $100,000, may it still be submitted knowing that only partial funding will be received? Yes, that is a great question, um, and you definitely can still submit. So we have our two funding levels. So you're either going to be asking for funding up to 50,000, or you're going to be asking for funding between 50 and 100,000. So if you are running a project and you are currently fundraising for $200,000, you um, will only be eligible to request funding up to 100,000 from the Viva Community Fund. 
but that does not restrict you from submitting. And one of the questions that we do ask during the submission form is whether you are receiving funding from other sources. We actually ask what your overall budget is and what is the amount you're requesting from Aviva. And then where will your funding go from, the, from Aviva specifically? And that's a great question because sometimes you're not requesting funds for your whole project. It's for a partial part of your project, which is totally eligible. Okay, great. I have a question from Alexandra. Um, can the funding be spent in a year, but the program continue afterwards? Yes, definitely. So if you're, pro if you're going to be using all of your funds in a year and the project is um, going to live on, that's, that's totally fine. Um, one, of the, one of the things about this year is the two-year funding period, which is up to two year funding period. So if you are planning on allocating all of your funds within the first year, um, then that's totally fine. We're slowly working through these questions, Julia. Um, do you have some time to stick around to answer a few more? Yes, for sure. Awesome, Julia says yes. Um, okay. Our next question is from Karen Piccolo, uh, can you clarify the accessibility requirements for an organization? For example, the nonprofit I work for offers support, diapers, clothing, formula, some food to young families and or single moms. So eligibility is open to nonprofit organizations. So off, first off is that if you are a nonprofit, you can submit an idea. But then you have to look forward to what exactly is the idea that you're requesting for funding. So you know that you're going to be eligible because of your status as a nonprofit, but now you have to think about what is the idea that you're asking for funding for? Where, where will your funds go? And then you have to determine whether you fall within the community health, development, or, health, or resilience. So I know you've mentioned a couple of things that that organization does. I think it's more about what is a larger project that they do and where does that fall under? Um, and again, we have those detailed descriptions of the idea categories on our website. Okay, our next question is from Lorna, uh, specifically about the voting. Can participants within the project vote for your idea from the computer lab within Charities Office as long as they are voting from a singular email belonging to them? Can staff vote using their work emails? So that's a great question. So. Um, you are not able to use a general email mailbox to register and have people vote from it. That, that's also because when you register on the Viva Community Fund, you're going to be giving your first and your last name. And once you cast your 18 votes, you, won't, you don't have any more votes to use. So let's say you were using one of your um, uh, info mailbox emails to register. Um, and you let somebody go on and cast 18 votes, there's no more votes associated with that email address. One thing that I will say is that if you are a group that has a, a computer lab or an employment center um, and you have multiple computers or you want to dedicate one specific computer to your ACF campaign, um, it's great to email us and let us know because we will see that there are votes being cast from one main IP address, but we do see that there's multiple different email addresses. So one of the things is that you will have to encourage everyone to register using that computer. Yes, they and they definitely can register using their work email address. Okay, great. I have a couple questions about categories here, so I'll give you two questions in one shot, Julia. Okay. So the first question is from Carissa, are community service cooperatives eligible to apply? Okay, and then the second question is going to be from Sylvie. Is there a category ideal for a charity that supports our aging population and those with dementia? Those are some great questions. So um, I, I definitely encourage you to look and to see what your incorporation papers are because you either need to be a CRA registered charity, which would have been designated to you by the CRA, um, or a nonprofit, um, social enterprise, a B Corp, um, if you are publicly funded school, municipality, or government entity. Um, and I'm just trying to think of what the last question was. Um, that just came through. Um, the question was, is there a category ideal for Right. So I would, off the top of my head, I would definitely say that you would fall into the community health um, 
uh, idea pillar, but there's there's way more detail on there um, to know if you if your program aligns with that. But I, off the top of my head, I would definitely say community health. Um, okay, we have a question from Patrick. What do you do with the registration data? Yeah, that's a great question because we definitely do get a lot of people registering on the ACF website. So when you register for the campaign, um, you are registering to receive information only about the Viva Community Fund. So what happens is that um, we have your email address and we send out emails regarding the campaign. So we're sending out letting you know who the finalists are, letting you know who the winners are. Um, and then once we announce the winners on December 5th, we send out some emails to keep you updated on what those groups are doing. Um, and then we, when we launch again next year, you'll receive some more information on the campaign. Um, we don't do anything with the registration data other than send information on the ACF. Um, but if you did feel that you did not want to receive information anymore, in your profile section on the Viva Community Fund website, you can opt out of receiving information. Um, but I just do want to caution that if you do opt out, you will receive absolutely no information on the Viva Community Fund. And if you are submitting an idea, you won't receive information on how your idea is progressing. Great. Um, I have a question from Ariel. Julia, you may have just answered that. Uh, when people register online on the Viva Community Fund website, Will they start receiving emails from communications not related to the voting process? So I'm not sure if you, when you say voting process, if you mean the Viva Community Fund, because we, when you register on the website, you receive information about the Viva Community Fund in general. So that does include the voting, the voting phase, but then it also includes telling you who the finalists are and the winners are. But all of the information that you receive does just pertain to the Viva Community Fund. Thank you for that. Um, our next question, um, if your organization has an impact in both a local and international location, uh, can we still submit our idea but have a focus on the local area within Canada? That's a great question. So when you're submitting to the Viva Community Fund, it has more to do with the exact project that you're submitting. So even if your organization has um, different missions and different focuses, I know that a lot of charities, we have different programs. So it is related to the program that you are submitting. So yes, if you are submitting a, an idea for a project that is within Canada and will only impact Canada, you are eligible. Okay, I have a great question from Neela here. Maybe you have some ideas, Julia, that can help her. Maybe you've come across this in the past. Uh, so, hi, my name is Neela with a nonprofit organization, and we work with senior citizens. What would be the most beneficial idea, considering most of them do not know how to use a computer or have an email address but would want to vote when it comes to the voting category? That is a great question. We did come across this once before, um, and the way that the organization dealt with it was that every senior um, had an emergency contact or had someone that was supporting them or bringing them in, um, and that person actually registered and voted for them. Another thing that um, you can do is you can create um, email addresses for your seniors um, and vote for them there. Um, again, this is a this is a um, a unique situation that we do run into and I think it, it does depend on each organization. We did have that one group that had um, the seniors did have family members and they reached out to them directly um, and then we had another group that set up and registered for for them themselves so um, hopefully one of those options can work for you. It's so wonderful Julia that uh, your team can accommodate these um, these situations. Um, our next question is from Roy. Is there an age restriction for participants who are registering? So during the registration process, um, if if somebody tries to register registers who's under 18, they they will have to self-identify that they have received um, a, gar a guardian or parent um, approval before registering. So and and the community legacy is only open to 18 to 25 year olds. But we have no age restrictions. Um, we do ask that if if somebody does self declare that they are under 18, that they do have a parent or guardian um, accept the terms and conditions on the of the campaign on their behalf. Okay, why don't we uh, just take two more questions because we're over our um, timing. Um, so let's see here. 
Um, we had a question come in um, from Alexandra. You mentioned earlier that the programs we create need to be open to everyone. Is it okay if we have qualifying criteria? For example, we have a program that supports children in care, but doesn't discriminate based on religion, etc. Yes, that is fine. So when we say that, um, one of the things to keep in mind is that we understand that programs are targeted towards community needs um, and that it could be a focused group and that a program might not be accessible to everybody. Um, so something specific to that would definitely still be eligible as a bona fide requirement. This also has to do with um, focusing on, on newcomers and homeless um, as well as indigenous populations. Okay, uh, good question from Doug here. Um, let's see, would you want the entire scope of the project described in each year? So, so that's a great question. Oh, um, like a question. Okay, the vision of idea could be implemented in phases. Could we reapply each year with a different phase as our focus? That's a great question. So I think that has to do with exactly what project you're trying to apply for. Um, and with the two-year funding, if you're receiving funds from us um, and the program is not done, um, you would have to reapply for a new program. So I think this is one to follow up and email me about with more details pertaining to exactly what phases um, and projects that you are talking about. But that's definitely a great question. Thank you so much, Julia. You're doing such a great job. If you want to take a sip of water, please feel free to go ahead and do that. Um, we have a question here from Doug. I don't think we answered this one yet. Our idea has many components to it. Will the submission be considered where the I entire idea may not proceed, but a component of the idea may be accepted? Does that make sense, Julia? I think that what you're trying to say is that you have a larger project with different aspects and that what would happen if one aspect got approved but one aspect didn't. So this is definitely where it would fall into the we need more information. So if you submit an idea where half of the project definitely aligned and was eligible and half didn't, we would have somebody reach out directly to you and find out more information and you might have to amend your project. Um, but that's definitely a great question, and that's why I encourage everyone to submit an idea because we do have a strong review process, um, and we might be able to provide some advice um, in the moment on how your uh, submission could still meet our eligibility criteria. Okay, um, I think this might be our last question here that we can take on. Um, so I saw this question come in a bunch of times. Julia, is this contest taking uh, place nationally from coast to coast? Is it, are people from the U.S. applying? I'll pass. So that's a great question. So the Viva Community Fund um, is being offered, this the specific one is um, all across Canada only. It is not in the U.S. But um, on a note is that the Aviva Community Fund is actually a global campaign. It started in Canada, um, and with our Aviva affiliates in the UK, they have now launched their own campaign specifically to the UK. And there's also a Aviva Community Fund in Poland as well that links up with the Aviva in Poland. Um, but this specific um, campaign is only across Canada. Thanks so much, Julia. Okay, it is now 3.17. Normally we and the webinar is at three o'clock, but I know there were so many awesome questions, we just couldn't bear to end it early. So thank you all for sticking around. You've asked some awesome questions today. We really wish you the best of luck. I know I can't wait to see what amazing ideas will be coming in this year. So make sure you tweet at us at Canada Helps and at Aviva Community Fund and um, you know share your ideas with us. I'm going to pass the headset on to Julia one last time so that she can share any final words that she might have. I just want to quickly say thank you so much for joining the webinar and that I really do hope that it was informative and that I really want everyone to take a look at those slides that provide the website and the email addresses so you can follow up directly if you have any questions related to, um, to the campaign. And I think the main thing is download the submission form that is on the site right now um, and just get ready and submit your ideas on September 13th. Um, and again, thank you so, so much.